Hi, everyone. I'm Deanna Clark with the Clark Esposito Law Firm, and I have the pleasure of having with me Janet Himmelrich and Bill Cameron from 3Comply to talk about the five must-haves for CMMC preparedness. Now, what the heck is CMMC? That stands for Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Hi, Janet. Hi, Bill. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. Nice to see you, Deanna. Thank you for having us. Nice to see you both. Uh, so let's dive in. And, you know, this acronym CMMC or Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, right? What, what does this mean anyway? Uh, and what types of Department of Defense contractors need to comply with it? That's a really good question. And I'm really glad that you mentioned about the Department of Defense. This program is currently just something of the Department of Defense, although there are other parts of the federal government looking at it. They've done a lot of work here, uh, but it applies to really anyone at all that has a contract, whether you're a prime contractor or you contract directly with part of the Department of Defense, or if you are a subcontractor. Uh, in fact, someone just mentioned the uh, in a webinar the uh, last week, it could be all the way down to the 17th person, you know, firm in the line, they're going to take a look at every subcontractor. So if you're familiar with the concept of flow downs, the prime contractors are responsible for flowing down these requirements to their subcontractors. And that goes with a procurement clause that is fondly known as 7012. Uh, and that is the one that is flowed down. It goes to the prime first and then it flows through. So in reality, this really does apply to anybody in the defense industrial base that has a contract with the Department of Defense. All right, so tell me, what is the Department of Defense problem that CMMC is trying to address? Yeah, well, it's a very interesting question because this is something that's actually a lot bigger than people may realize. Unfortunately, there are uh, not only organizations, but state actors which are attacking people with an organization specifically within the defense industrial base to steal information and it's happening at an alarming rate um and and there's some comparisons where there's um there's jets by other countries and you look at our jet and he's like hmm, that kind of looks similar that's not by you know that's that's not by coincidence so uh, they know that this information is being stolen. They know that it's at susceptible and the entities are going after the softer targets, which are the smaller companies that are not as well protected as some of the big prime uh, contractors. There are three levels of CMMC. Why is that? It's a, it's a matter of complexity. So many small and, and uh, medium sized businesses, when these rules first came out, which is going on three years ago, they, they originally came out in 2020, uh, we're very upset by the complexity of what's out there because the, the NIST 800 standards that are used for the whole of cybersecurity uh, management within the Department of Defense for anybody, whether you're uh, a prime big company or a small one, uh, they are complicated. If you have to do all of them, they're complicated. So people got very upset about that, especially small businesses. So when they redid them and republished them in 2021 with what's now CMMC 2.0, so we just finally call it 2.0, uh, they limited it down from five to three. Um, and they are, the simple ones are the federal contract information only, the, which is level one, Level two is the the advanced and where we think most people will be. Level three is for very sophisticated, you know, kind of outside of the norm of people that we'd be speaking with. So that's why there's three levels and we're at CMMC 2.0. And I just want to mention that, by the way, these are not yet completely in place. They have not actually been published yet. Uh, so we are still working on the guidance from 2021 that we believe is you know, substantially going to be where it is. Right. <laughs> so they're not yet published, but um, you know, we're familiar with working with laws that are almost in existence. Um, but so we hear about these technical terms, you know, what is the NIST standard 800-171? That is in place currently, is that correct? Yes, uh, and, it's, and it's been in place for 
quite some time. Um, the there's again, there's two things that are tied in. There is a DFARS clause 7012, which requires that contractors comply with NIST 800171, which basically is talking about the protecting of controlled unclassified information within non-federal systems. And what that means is basically you think of something that's not part of the government. So if you have this special type of information called control on classified information, and a lot of times that's things which are definitely not public, it's a little bit more sensitive than just information that having to do with a federal contract. This might be technical information. It might be plans. It could be, you know, specific things regarding information that they wouldn't want to go out and get public. It's not been considered classified, but it's, it's, they're, they're protecting those, that type of information. The NIST 800 is 110 controls, but the, something that's interesting is the law says it's the whole thing. There's, there's appendices that are also in there, which a lot of people didn't pay attention to later on. And there's more stuff in the appendices than people actually really notice. So there's definitely a lot more to it than what meets the eye. Isn't that always the case? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, what I want to do now, I've got one other question, but I want to go ahead and I want to share, um, or I want you to share rather, you know, what are your five must-haves for CMMC preparedness? Um, Janet, do you want to start with the first one? Yeah, sure. So the first one is that size doesn't matter. No matter what size you are, and I know from our dealings with many size companies that small companies just think this doesn't, how can it possibly apply to me but they do they're not prescriptive they're for you to figure out what applies and what doesn't apply uh, in a given situation so whether you're a micro business or you're one of the largest contractors like Northrop Grumman or something like that these apply it's just scaled it's scaled to what you do and you know a small micro business may have quite a bit that is just not applicable what you have to do though is figure out why you have to substantiate your decision that it's not applicable so that's why the first one we have is size does not matter thanks very much bill what's the second one the second one it's all about the data uh and really what this comes down to is you have to know what you actually have in order to protect it um and this will help in lots of different ways but uh, for example, one of our approaches is to look at somebody's business, figuring out, okay, how do you do business and where does this information come into your workflow? How does, how is it being used? How, where is it? Uh, what type of things are you managing and handling? Uh, and then you can put, apply the proper protections around that. Um, and there's lots of different ways to be able to smartly approach this whole situation. But in reality, that's what it comes down to. And it's all about the data. Isn't it always? Uh, so, Janet, what would be the next must have? Interesting thing. Most people think, oh, I can just do this once. I'm done with it. I never have to look at it again. That's not true, of course. Uh, you have to be in this for the long haul. Uh, so, once you put these things in place, what a, an assessor is going to be looking for is evidence that it's how you operate. You didn't just you know, put it out, write it down put it on a shelf somewhere, you actually are operating the way that you now have adapted to. And that's why uh, there's monitoring, there's all kinds of things that have to be done. So you have to be in this for the long haul. All right, so this isn't a short term thing. Uh, probably must have the mindset that we are in this for the long haul, right? Absolutely. So Bill, what would be the next must have? Uh, the next one is policies and procedures can't be shelfware. And what I use by this is oftentimes organizations, in order to get through a certification or something, put a lot of work and effort into a policy or procedure. They print it out. I mean, in in literal sense, print it out, put it on a shelf. It collects dust and nobody looks at it again until they have to. So that's what I mean by shelfware. You actually have to be able to make, show evidence that you are following your policies and your procedures and they're accurate and people are trained on it and you have evidence. So it's not something that is a checkbox. Hey, I, I, you know, I purchased a whole bunch of policies and procedures and we're good to go. No, you actually have to prove it. So that definitely the fourth one is policies and procedures can't be shelf. 
Excellent, okay. Uh, and so Janet, can you give us the fifth one, please? Yeah, this is an interesting one. We've kind of touched on it as we've been talking, but in using it in a different way, small, small is good here. And I'm not talking about a small business. I'm actually talking about the scope. What you decide you're going to de define as the scope. There are guidances out there for both level one and level two about scoping. And what you want to do is make the smallest possible scope that you can. Like if it's say that your federal contracts are maybe 20% of your business, then you don't want to have to do all this stuff for the other 80%. So you can define a smaller parts, small number of people, small number of systems, and then we can develop something called an enclave. And within that enclave, you just operate within these parameters. So small in this case, small is really good. You want to be small for this. All right, so last but not least, and most importantly, um, what is the one thing that people should be doing right now for CMMC compliance? I would say the first thing is to be able to understand where your data is uh, and be able to know what you actually have. That is perhaps the, the largest thing that you can do from a business perspective and from a technical perspective, the one thing you can do is make sure you put in multi-factor authentication with also good passwords uh, in place should not be a very complicated thing to do and super important to get you on the right path. I'll just add from a preparedness sense, uh, we mentioned that data is king, data is king, data is queen, data is everything. Uh, you have to be prepared first and foremost to know what data you have and then be able to determine whether it's controlled unclassified information or it's just federal contract information. So that's where from a preparedness sense, uh, once you've put in place your multi-factor uh, authentication, and by the way, make sure that everybody's passwords are passwords that would pass muster, if you will, uh, then you need to move on to be able to identify your data. So there's multiple answers, unfortunately, Dina, uh, but I think you know those two things, the multi-factor authentication and then preparing to understand what data you have and where it is are the two most important things. How about that? We'll give you two for one. <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you. And uh, so Janet and Bill, thank you for joining me today for this interview. Thank uh, you very much for having time. us. Three Comply, you know, it's a company that helps, uh, helps those companies in highly regulated industries. Uh, they provide consulting implementation and software solutions and they can be reached at their website uh, that's www.3comply.com you can contact them by pushing the contact button at the top of their homepage. they can also be reached by phone the telephone number is 401-252-1800 or you can contact them by email at comply at 3comply.com I'm Deanna Clark with the Clark Esposito Law Firm. You can also reach out to our office through our homepage using our contact form. You can also call our office at 917-546-6997 or via email at contact at clarkespositolaw.com. See you next time. Subscribe and click the bell icon so you'll be the first to know when we upload a new video. Check out our playlist if you want to see more of our videos, and comment below and introduce yourself. We'll see you soon.